Our next okay. speaker is uh, Professor Emmett Witchell. Emmett works in operating systems and architecture, most recently in concurrency and security. Emmett, take it away. Thanks, Thanks very much. Hi, so I'm Emmett Witchell. I'm here to talk about uh, the future of computer systems, which is a far more grandiose title for a talk than I'm used to giving, so you'll have to forgive me a little bit. I mean, prediction is hard, right, especially about the future, so uh, there, there's been plenty of terrible predictions about computer science. I was, I was asked uh, to, to predict the next 50 years in computer systems, so, you know, there's a, a world market for maybe five computers. I don't actually think the president of IBM ever said that, but it's widely attributed to him. Um, you know, there's not that many videos I want to watch, the CTO of YouTube. I certainly understand where he was coming from. And uh, I'm not immune to this syndrome. Uh, in 2010, I said the iPad was going to be a huge failure, and you know, now I own four of them. So uh, I told my kids, if you want to make uh, uh, you know, correct predictions about the future, just be consistent. So I was correct about the Apple Watch being a failure. I was just wrong about the iPad. So who do we look to uh, in society to predict the future? So that's a, a picture of H.G. Wells, because I didn't want to put, put a picture of Steve Jobs. I've seen enough pictures of him. So we looked to uh, science fiction. Uh, there's a, there's a, a show called uh, Black Mirror that was developed on the BBC and is now on Netflix. It does a lot of really interesting things about technology and, and, and science. Um, in our society, entrepreneurs get a lot of credit. So I think Steve Jobs, uh, you know, his technical contributions were slight, but he had some, some really great sort of business contributions. Unfortunately, today you're stuck with a professor. So what do we do? Nobody knows. But uh, I, I like to think of us as looking at the near future, you know, more like three or five years out. We tend to look at very specific technologies. So rather than talk about that in some of my work, which I thought would maybe be sort of boring for a general purpose crowd, I'm going to talk a little bit about general ideas like what is computer systems? So with apologies to Raymond Carver, you know, what do we, what do we care about when we care about computer systems? So in order to figure out what's still going to be uh, worthwhile in 50 years, we can look back 50 years and say, what are the issues uh, that were interesting then that are still interesting today? So when I tell people I'm a computer science professor, a lot of times they say, oh, that must be so difficult. Your field changes so quickly. And that's true. Parts of it really do change quickly. But the idea of being a professor is you want to see what doesn't change. And you want to focus on that because insights about the parts that don't change are going to remain valuable over the long term. So distributed computing, uh, that's the idea that can you make uh, many computers look like one great computer. What do I mean by a great computer? A great computer is one that doesn't fail. It processes really quickly. It's got a huge amount of storage. So trying to make a lot of computers look like one really awesome computer is something that we've been working on for 50 years. We've made a lot of progress. But I think it's, it's true that 50 years from now, we'll still be, be working on it. Another topic is programming languages. So how do you express your ideas to a computer? How do you write programs? These tend to change fairly slowly because human beings develop expertise in them, but they still change because even though computer languages are simpler than human languages, they are a form of human expression, and humans are driven to greater and more creative forms of human expression. I think in 50 years, we still will have that drive. Uh, computer systems tend to have two pieces. They have software and they have hardware. And so software that controls the latest hardware is another topic of, of research. So if you know about graphical processing units, GPUs, there's a picture of one. These have really revolutionized computation in the past 10 years. Uh, but there's been a lot of work uh, to make that hardware really useful. So a lot of software systems to make the, the hardware programmable. And then finally, it's an area that I'm interested in and done some work in, security. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But right now, I want to start with distributed computing and a topic that you might have heard about, and that is cloud computing. Right, so what is cloud computing? Uh, you know, it's using a, a network of internet servers to store, manage, and process your data. I needed to read that one. So you might know it as, you know, where am I storing my photos? I'm going to store them on iCloud rather than storing them on my phone. And why would I want cloud computing? Why don't I just store my photos on my phone? Well, you know, I get a new phone or my phone might fail. so. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my uh, uh, photos on, on a single machine and back them up. That requires some expertise, but maybe it's still manageable uh, until you reach the point uh, maybe where that machine fails. Uh, and maybe you've got five years of family photos on that machine. It's truly devastating. So instead of just backing them up onto one machine, you're also going to have a backup disk. A little bit harder, but maybe that's OK. Then you get to the point where you have enough photos and videos. You need two backup disks. It doesn't fit on one backup disk. 
you know, pretty soon you'll be like me. It's like my hobby is backing up data. I mean, it's, I spend way too much time doing it. Um, and then, uh, you know, you'll end up eating your computer, which I, I think that's the universal sign of frustration. So the idea of cloud computing is they're going to take away that burden from you, and, and, and they're going to do it. And one thing I, I, I think that's very true about cloud computing is not only it's useful, uh, it's also a great name. So a lot of the ideas in cloud computing originated in a topic that was called grid computing. And when I first heard that term, I actually thought they meant grid like that. And I, I thought, this is just the worst name of all time. Like, what is grid computing? Well, it turns out they actually were talking about the electrical grid. They were talking about making computing as easy to use and as reliable as the electrical grid. And that's a little bit of a better name, but I think cloud computing is, is far better, right? It's, clouds are pretty, they're mysterious. <laughs> and there's an enormous amount of compute in the cloud. So what are we talking about? Every single day, Amazon adds the same computing capacity that it took to run its entire business in 2003. And it wasn't small in 2003, it was a $5.2 billion company. So this enormous amount of hardware is being added into the cloud every day. Their storage, uh, Amazon storage uh, layer is processing half a million requests per second, every second, 24 hours a day. And if you look at, if you compare the cost of what goes on in the cloud, even versus a fairly large scale installation, like a thousand servers, forget about you and me backing up our photos, things are a lot cheaper in the cloud. And they're cheaper for some economic reasons. Just like Costco, it's cheaper to buy uh, ketchup there because you, you always buy too much. Uh, uh, in the cloud, if you have networking storage devices, they get enormous discounts, five to seven times cheaper. But the real magic happens in administrative costs. So there's a variety of hardware and software technologies, virtualization and whatnot, that allow one system administrator to administer tens of thousands of machines in the cloud. And that just pushes the costs down so far that they can do things like, in 2015, Amazon offered unbounded storage for $60 a year, which I have to admit, when I saw that, I was like, well, you know, I'm in. <laughs> All right, so shifting gears for a minute, I want to talk a little bit about computer security. So computer security is always in the news, right? So recently, there was this humongous breach, uh, half a billion accounts uh, from Yahoo. It's the largest data breach ever. And, uh, you know, names, email addresses, dates of birth, these are very valuable uh, to potentially break into other accounts uh, that you might hold or potentially to, to do identity fraud. Uh, we're having a presidential election in the United States that's been influenced by what we believe are Russian hackers that got a bunch of emails, disclosed them to WikiLeaks from the Democratic National Committee and, and uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the, the chairperson of that committee, lost her job on, uh, because of that. And so these types of, of stories in the news, they're not rare, but they tend to make you think that all of security is about safeguarding secrets. And certainly safeguarding secrets are an important component of security, but it's not the only thing. So here's a distinction that I, I'd like to leave you with, if there's sort of one technical idea I can leave you with, and that is there are two different uh, ideas we talk about when we talk about security. One is privacy and one is integrity. So the idea of privacy is sort of what we've been talking about, which is I have some sensitive data and I don't want you to read it. Okay, I might have some financial information, I don't want you to know it. I might have some healthcare information, I don't want you to know it. So it's about reading sensitive data. Uh, you know, if you're, you might debate about whether you wanna put your family's pictures on Facebook, that's a privacy debate. Integrity is slightly different. Integrity is when I have sensitive data and I don't want you to write it. Now why would you wanna write my sensitive data? Mostly because that's a way you can take over a computer system. So if you overwrite my operating system, if you overwrite certain configuration files, you can then get control over my computer. And in that case, you can then do several things. One thing is you might compromise my privacy. You might steal private files. But you can do other things. You might steal my money. You can take all the money out of my bank account, which doesn't compromise my privacy, but it sure is a bummer. Another thing you can do is you can embarrass me. You can send out emails as me and, you know, I don't know, include funny pictures or something. But the point of integrity really is, what devices do you trust and with what data do you trust them? So our phones, for instance, have a huge amount of personal information about us, about where we go, about pictures, who we know, and so we should have higher standards for the integrity of our phone than we do for our desktop devices. And by and large, that has been the case. So why is computer security so hard? 
Well, I would argue that it's hard for reasons that have nothing to do with computer. Security itself is hard. Why? Because the underlying issues in security are how do you manage your secrets and how do you manage your trust. And these are issues that we learn, even as kids, it's difficult, right? Have you ever told your secrets to the wrong person? You know, I certainly have. Who do you trust with your healthcare decisions? Who has access to your bank account? These are difficult issues. And we as a society have worked to try to foster trust in certain intimate relations. For instance, I can't be compelled in a court of law to testify against my wife. And the reason that, uh, I, sorry, I should say spouse, uh, testify uh, against my spouse. The reason that society does that is in order to foster trust in intimate relationships. This is a difficult process that we need legal support with uh, because it's hard for human beings uh, to do it. The thing about computers is they don't make the security more difficult, they just make it easier to exploit. So it used to be if you had a, a bad guy who broke into the Hall of Records, they got the records for everybody who lived in the town, maybe in the city. Now you break into Yahoo, you get records from all around the world, all around the country. So now a single exploit can just uh, compromise the privacy of many, many individuals. That's really what has changed about computers. So here's a quick authentication story about how bad authentication is in the real world, how difficult it is to do. When I was 18 years old, my dad dropped off the car to be fixed at, at, at a repair shop. And I went in at the end of the day, we look a little bit alike. I mean, he's my dad, but like he's old or was old. Now I'm old, but at the time I was 18. And I just walked in and I said, hey, I'm Witchell. I'm here to pick up the car. I, I didn't know what car it was. I'd forgotten. Uh, I didn't know what it was in the shop for. And they didn't even look at my driver's license to see that I was actually named Witchell. They just gave me the keys to the car. But why? Because authentication is difficult. Authentication is the process of uh, uh, verifying who you are. Wh what, what is your identity and how did you prove your identity? It's a hard thing to do, but it's hard to exploit in the physical world. It's a lot easier to exploit for computers. I had another issue about uh, computer security. So <laughs> you do hear a lot this argument that, well, you know, today's media, social media obsessed world, privacy doesn't matter anymore. And I think that's a simplistic uh, viewpoint. So there was a study done about Fitbit users, where Fitbit uh, you know, is this little device that you wear that measures uh, certain features about your health. And it turns out, that people care about how and where their data is shared, sort of depending on the context. So for instance, no one wanted to share data about their weight. That was not something, you wanted to keep that locked in the Fitbit, and most people did. But they were willing to share data about their heart rate. You know, there are people who are willing to share data with their family, but they don't want to share data with advertisers. Are they willing to share data with a Fitbit company? Well, you know, you split the difference. Some people are, some people are not. And there's now a whole theory called contextual integrity that, that um, studies this fact that privacy is not just a binary decision anymore. It really depends on the context in which your data is used. You know, another argument that you hear a lot uh, if you work in privacy and security is, you know, why do you need privacy at all? If you have nothing to hide, you don't need privacy. So, you know, first of all, I'd say, why is it so bad to have something to hide? I mean, it's hard to get through life without making any mistakes. You know, I can tell you I'm glad I didn't go to college uh, when there was social media. You know, there's like a, a, a great tradition in the United States. Uh, you know, someone moves to town, makes a big mess of things, has an affair with the, you know, the mayor's wife, gets run out of town, moves further west, and becomes a pillar of the community. You know, guilt is a motivating factor. This is how people work. And people have been thinking about this for hundreds of years. There's a great quote I found from uh, uh, the 1890s where they really defended the right to privacy, the right to be left alone, is just like the right to not be assaulted, not to be imprisoned, not to be maliciously prosecuted. It's an important right and it should be defended. On sort of a trivial level, I try not to give my address to businesses, uh, but you know, when I was younger, I got into this argument, this guy really wanted my address. I said, no, you're gonna send me mail. He's like, we're not gonna send you mail. I'm like, yes, you are. He's like, look, I promise I'm gonna put a note in here. We won't send you mail. I said, fine, I gave him my address. Three weeks later, I get mail sent to Emmett Witchell, no mail. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I'll leave you with this. So, uh, you know, predictions about the future, because I, I sort of, I did a bait and switch. I was asked to talk about the future, and I just talked about the past, but you know, that's, uh, I'm a professor, I just like to talk, so. Uh, you know, I think for computer systems, brain-computer interaction is an interesting topic. Uh, I think there's a, a, a interesting hardware and software challenges. Currently, uh, it's really used for people who've had injury and to recover from that. 
but I think there are a lot of communication and entertainment possibilities in the future. You know, we've heard a lot about how awesome tech is, how, you know, driverless cars are gonna, you know, reduce accidents and stuff, and I think that's true, but, you know, I think you also need to look at the potential downsides of technology. So, you know, uh, nobody misses the buggy whip manufacturers and nobody misses the secondary markets like buggy whip repair, but we're currently eliminating a lot of white collar jobs for potentially the first time in human history, and, you know, I hope there are other jobs to replace it, but I'm not sure exactly what they are. And I think that any vision that's positive of the future includes humans doing meaningful work. But finally, to conclude on, try to conclude on a more optimistic note, um, I do think that uh, creating software is a great thing. It's been a lot of fun for me, and I think that even in the next 50 years, it will remain a challenging, fulfilling, and societally valuable task. And so I certainly encourage you to, to study computer science.